So let's start. First of all, who am I? Um, I'm Alexander Kanievsky. I'm working in Intel as a software architect. Um, I was doing the Linux distributions for quite many years. It's practically, it will be 20 years in a few months. Um, I did the Linux distributions for local markets, for like with localization, for desktop, for servers, when later on for Nokia, for mobile devices, tablets and phones, when lately uh, in Intel for Tizen, and for a few more years with Yocto. So I wanted to share some of experience how inside Intel we are using Yocto tools to build distributions for our internal products. I think what we're going to talk today is actually what it actually means for pro platforms, products, what is continuous integration, how, how, or how to establish continuous delivery for your products, what tools and how to organize with source code. Um, many people are talking about the content, like what you are putting inside your distro, but few people are talking about actually how you do it. And I want to share that. So the first thing, platforms and products. Just a quick quiz. So how many of you are using Yocto and Pocky? Oh, pretty much everyone. Great. So platform for you, it will be easy to understand. It's like Pocky. You have uh, Bitbake, you have OE Core, you have a bunch of other layers what you want to use. Um, Practically, it's a distribution what you are targeting for multiple devices with multiple functionality. So you, you develop features over here. In my example, I will be using our reference IoT distribution, which is public. You can look how it's implemented. The CI part of it is also public. Go have a look like how our developers look working with it in real life. A product. This is something what you usually, you take a platform, you, you have a few configuration file changes, like a few tweaks. You probably, you don't care about multiple devices. You have like one or two which you are targeting to. And in my example, again, it's our Intel reference IoT kit for Intel Joule product. Again, have a look, see how it's implemented. The practices. Continuous integration, continuous delivery. Buzzwords, right? So many people are know those or think what we are know about it. What it means in reality, like in plain words. A continuous integration. Old, old practice. You need to build everything, you need to test everything, you need to visualize status. You define what is broken state and um, Here's the important thing. You define what is a broken state. And in case if you notice a broken state, it's for your highest priority to actually go and fix it. And this is not something what people are actually doing. Obviously, this practice has evolved over the years. So there is a new thing. It's called two-stage continuous integration. Many people are practicing it, but again, without really realizing what it is. The thing is, it's, it's, it's a method or practices to prevent you to get into broken state. So prevent you from making your code line in a state where development cannot happening. It's like, get your changes in your sandboxes, like it can be called differently, like patch sets or master next or pull request in GitHub, doesn't really matter how you call it, but it's a sandbox where you test it and when you are satisfied, you merge it. Next thing, continuous delivery. So in plain words, it's your process of uh, what happens with your software between the time when developer changes it until, what you, until the time what, when you ship of a product to end customers. So, well, what is changing nowadays? Our users are expecting what software is updated regularly on your devices. 
with small iterations, with new features, with small bug fixes, but often. You need to make sure what your releases are rolling. And all of those practices, everything, it all targeted one single motor. So you need to maximize throughput of your good changes and minimize the breakages. <coughs> Sorry. So let's, how, let's see how to do it. Let's start with source code management. You need to, you need to have a system where you actually allow your developers to collaborate. And by collaborate, I mean, like, you need to have sandboxes, you need to have uh, reviews, and for that you have nowadays a lot of choices. You can have GitHub, you can have Bitbucket, you can have something hosted by your own, like GitLab, Gerrit, um, and to, just to predict the question, Git, uh, Gitalite, Patchworks, probably not the best tools for you at the moment. Why? Because the tools for what you're using for source code management, you need to have a few key features. People need to have easily to create sandboxes. You need to, get to, ha you need to have a good integration with CI systems. So it means like APIs. You need to have a good status tracking. So you shouldn't get to a situation when a person sends a patch to mailing list and then waits for months Figuring, uh, trying to figure out what is the state of his patch. Um, and then suddenly realize what, like, yeah, it was merged. Sorry. Um, for us, we, the choice was obvious. We used GitHub. It gave us whatever we did. Uh, it actually gave us a bit more uh, more things like access controls and groups for our developers. So let's see how it's implemented. The way how we organize the source code for our platforms. You need to understand, the Yocta is about integration. You have two, two activities, development and integration. Development is happening in layers. Um, layers, um, it's a set of reusable components. It's your recipes, it's your features. You might use it in more than one distribution. And you need to have a release repository. A release repository is actually something what you ship. It's one single thing what users should take, download, build, and this is what your, what your release are, consists of. So how you do it? A release repository is done by Combo Layer 2. It's one of the oldest tool in the Yocta project and probably one of the least known tool in the Yocta project. What it is about? It knows about set of repositories. It takes commit out of it and push it to this release repository. You have a configuration file, and this configuration file um, describes what is, what is inside of it. Like location, files, where to put the files, and the last tracked revision of it. How to update that file? Regularly in Pocky, it's done by Richard or some other maintainers, we run it manually. In our case, we run it um, in CI system. So CI is actually controlling what and when we are uh, moving the things between layers into our release repository. What allows us actually to do quality and schedule gate. So for example, you might want to have um, well, the quality gate is obvious. You, you merge only the things what works. So if Bitbake introduces the change which breaks your build, you probably won't, don't want to take it. The same thing, um, like if you are trying to ship a product very soon, you probably don't want to accept the changes from OE Core. Or you want to delay it for a while. So for layers, the service what we want to implement. You have 
layer repository. You have developers who want to contribute. And the natural way of contributing is obviously it's pull request. So a pull request, it's a sandbox of changes. It's built on the latest state of a release repository. It tested on the real hardware. And when you provide a um, feedback to the developers. So for example, if, if your branches changes, if um, maintainers merge it another change and GitHub notifies what the head change, you, you do rebuilds and again you provide the status to the developer what, what is going on. Um, with help of GitHub integration, the maintainers have ability to use the magic comments in the pull requests, which says that please retest that thing or not. With magic things, it actually helps with um, a few other things. Like if you operate in public, obviously not all the code what comes from unknown developers, um, you want to take, um, or well, you want to build immediately. Because we all know, Yocto is not fully isolated from the host. So we provide also some security measures what maintainers can have a look at uh, code which comes from a per person who, doesn't, uh, who we don't know and then say like, yes, it's okay to test that thing. So the service for release repository. Again, obviously, anytime you merge something, uh, you perform a build. Here is one underwater storm. So if you, if your platform release actually produce the package feeds, you must probably you have a, you need to have a version going forward for, for packages what you produce. So for release repository, you might want to limit what you have only one concurrent build for, for the branch. And another thing what, again, people not often realize is what you need to promote the builds. You build it once, you test it, you, you, you perform the slow test. And again, with exactly the same set of binary artifacts, it's something what you need to publish to your customers. You don't need to rebuild it anymore. Like one single build ID, one set of binary artifacts for it. Um, what happens with pull request to that repository? We created a thing which is called Upstream Monitor. What this Upstream Monitor is about? It monitors everything what is written in combo layer, like every single repository. And um, once it detects the change in one of those repositories, it creates a pull request or updates the existing one uh, with new set of changes. So pretty much, the maintainer of release repository, he always have ability to see, okay, what is the pending set of changes, what we are coming from all the layers what, uh, from which we are con uh, constructing our repository. Um, this is automatic part, but maintainers have ability to do the things uh, manually. So for example, maintainer can say, I want to take this important bit bake fix, or I want to take this BSP fix, but I, don't, I want to postpone the rest of the things. Um, usually, um, we don't accept any pull request from other people. However, there are certain scenarios where those uh, pull requests here might be considered as legitimate. What are those? One, and the most important one is when people want to introduce a new layer. So developer just need to update the combo layer configuration file saying this is a new repository I want to include. The rest will be triggered by an um, upstream monitor. So it will pull in the repository, you will see how it builds. Another legitimate case is when you need to test the um, big changes. Big changes means what you need to, you have a scenarios when you need to synchronize, like you need to change something in your BSP, you need to change something in your configuration files, like image files, or in worst case scenario, you need to try to uh, fix for upstream tools, um, like BitBake or some of OE core classes. That way you send it, you see how it works in your release. 
quite complex, right? So we need to have a good engine for that. And for engine, we use Jenkins. Why? Few things. Obviously, it's newcomer friendly, so you have a web UI, you can configure it. There are tons of plugins for it. But the most important thing, it's scriptable and it DevOps friendly. It means what you can automate whatever you do there. The implementation of it. So classical set of jobs. You have orchestrator jobs. So for every layer, you have job which, uh, which performs for build for a branch or for pull request. So you can have unlimited amount of branches. But the pull request, it's usually one job which handles all of the jobs. So it figures out what is the destination branch and when uses the corresponding release repository for it. So if you have like dozen of layers, you have dozens of jobs, or well, two dozens of jobs. But the actual build is pretty much the same on all the time. So you have, or at least we have, we have a two set of uh, targets, which is used for all the layers and all the release repositories. So we have build job, which is dependent on each machine. So each machine is built on separate server. And we have a test hardware. So test hardware is interesting thing, because um, you might have, in Yocto terms, you have like three machines. But some of the builds for a particular machine in Yocto term can be tested on multiple different hardwares. So that's where there is a is distinguishing between machine and test hardware. And obviously, you have a bunch of um, post-processing jobs, like publishing, promotion, maintenance of download servers, whatever, um, which we maintain. Big, complex, sometimes hard to replicate. But it gives ability to produce a platform system. What happens with products? Um, we try to, to simplify things. Um, and we wanted to use sometimes new technologies, sometimes um, a bit different technologies so or different ways. So one of uh, new technology what we wanted to use is Jenkins 2.0 feature, the pipeline. And this pipeline, it allows you to do one thing. You practically, you have a GitHub repository. You can have a multi-branch. And inside of this Git repository, you have file which describes actually how to build that thing. It's like, you know, like the grand file, docker file, make file, the same thing here. You have a Jenkins file, and it describes what to do. It's easy scripting, it's easy to, to do a parallel execution, it's easy to, um, like to do a persistent tasks, which is, in classical Jenkins, it's not really possible. And how it looks? Something like that. You define where the source code, like check out, run the shell script. Um, your shell script is actually part of your repository, so you don't need to maintain it in a separate place. The pipeline, the whole product is one single repository for you. And the same thing with build targets. It's again, it's part of your source code. So developers can easily adjust what we build. So, few other different technologies what we are using. One thing is a reproducible environment. Again, Yocto is not fully isolated from a host. And we've seen a lot of situations when um, result on one distribution is not the same result with different compiler on another distribution. We try to isolate that. We provide a Docker container, so user, can easily download our product repository. It, he needs to have a Docker installed, but afterwards he runs one script like local build, and the scripts will handle creation of a isolated clean environment specifically for a build, like with nothing less, uh, with nothing more and nothing less what is needed. 
and perform a build. So, and in reality, this actually allows us to do even Yocto builds on the Mark, like with Docker for Mark integration. It's the same set of scripts, it's done transparently. Another thing which we also try to use is Git sub models instead of uh, combo layer. Again, for product, you need to have a very simple thing. You want to take specific release of your platform. You want to override a couple of uh, uh, configuration parameters. You might have a bit different uh, set of images what you're trying to build. Um, you might have a couple of more additional layers, but that's it. Like your, your product is often not very different from, from your platform. And submodels, to that extent, it's a bit easy to, to introduce. So, the big, the big difference, two approaches. So, this combo layer is obvious. You have a self-hosted repository, all good, you control, you see all the changes, you can track where, where it comes from and so on. The bad thing, it clutters your, build, uh, your, your git history. You see, like, if an open and bid it, it's, you have 200 commits, you will see 200 commits in your git log. It might be uh, hard to, um, to review, but no, depends on what people. With Git sub models, it's a bit easier. So, the, the combo layer approach, it doesn't prevent you to change some files in some subdirectory. With sub models, it's a bit more tricky because you are referring to some uh, third party repository. And this third party repository, unless you have commit rights, where you cannot change the file. And that actually goes to cons part. So when you are using sub models, you are dependent on some other hosting. So if your upstream part force pushed something, or host gone down, you lose your uh, you lose your setup. Second thing is actually also it's a bit harder to review the changes because when you do a pull request for sub model, it's actually you see you have you are moving between one comment state to another comment state, and you need to go to that repository and do a div between those two if you want to see where. Uh, what is actually changing to <coughs> So, infrastructure, how it's done in the backend. We have two parts. One part is publicly facing, like it's obvious, like website, download site, and when we have Jenkins in outside. Practically, Jenkins, Jenkins master to outside is for two things. One is to provide UI for developers where we can look for the logs. And second, to have um, GitHub integration where you, have, you use the hooks for it. But then, what is backend? Backend, um, we have obviously set of builders. We have testing harness with a bunch of test of devices. And by the way, those two clusters where can be um, in different places. And our setup, it's, it's funny. Uh, builders are in United States, test devices are in Finland. Few things for um, builder clusters. You want to have a NAS. You, you need to have a local storage. Yocto produces an enormous amount of data. Um, and that's actually where few of underwater storms are happening the S state. Um, you need to have a few maintenance jobs which prefer, which taking care of that S state. You have something what is available for the builders, but you also have something what you need to upload afterwards to the public site what our developers will be able to benefit. Another thing is um, coordination of few things. So as I mentioned, if you have a Sorry. Um, 
if you have a package feeds, you need to use the service which is called PR server. And if you try to do a distributed build between like multiple hosts, you need to have a single place where you say PR server is over here, go and fetch for revision what I need to use for that package. And if you do the same thing for multiple branches, for multiple for multiple architectures or for pull requests, you need to have multiple instances of that, uh, of that PR server. So we are using a host called Coordinator for, for doing that. There are a couple of other maintenance jobs running on this Coordinator host. Obviously, it's hard to maintain all of those things. And we did quite a lot of things that simplify our life. So the initial provisioning, we are using Ansible, well defined with DevOps tool. And um, our set of playbooks, how we provision Jenkins workers and all our hosts, um, we are open, have a look and feel free to reuse, feel free to comment and pro provide the suggestions to improve all of those. What happens with the jobs? We are using a thing which is called Jenkins Job DSL. It's again, it's scriptable part which allows us to, um, to easily maintain those hundreds of jobs what we have for every branch, for every layer repository, for every pull request and so on. And we have uh, in this repository where we maintain the Jenkins configurations, like two branches, like one is production, one is, um, one is staging. Obviously, like we have two setups. We, we have public and we have staging in private, so we can try a few of the changes before actually we go to a production level. In, in reality, the whole your deployment of your scripts, of your configuration has become just a git push. We did a couple of interesting tricks here. So one trick is actually the initial, Jenkins initial seed. You configure one thing, one single job which says, here's the repository where we have all configurations and this is where script which says, how to, how to set up the rest of the things. In our case, with initial setup, it, it does few, few magic. <laughs> this magic is actually, it verifies what all the needed plugins are in, installed in all the shape. And afterwards, it starts to create with jobs like all the maintenance jobs, all the seed jobs. And by seed jobs, it's actually, it's actually something what tr helps you to dynamically manage your configuration. So imagine, like you have a conf uh, combo layer configuration file and it describes, this is the layers what, you, what I want to use. You know exactly which branch, which Git repository, uh, what you are interested in. So your DSL script can read that configuration file and then create as many jobs as you need. So for us, the maintenance become really, really easy. We just saying, here's where our repository, the rest, the rest is there. We don't create jobs anymore by hand. And you are not limited uh, to one branch. You might have, like we are mostly using the rolling release model. So for us, the master is important. But if you have a maintenance branches, you do the same thing for maintenance that it will create a few dozens of our jobs for you automatically. So, a few other tools. The automatic testing part. You've seen probably today or yesterday or maybe tomorrow, it will be a few hour presentation, a lot of about um, automatic testing. People are trying to use Lenaro Lava. It's a good system, big one. Um, 
with good community, but we want something smaller. We want something what people can easily reproduce. So it's basic set of tools which provides well, automatic flashing, it provides for the networking to a test device, it controls power, um, in some cases it also pro uh, controls uh, keyboard emulation to select which, which we boot devices are. In our testing setup, we, we can handle majority of PC-like devices with UEFI boot, Beagle Bones, and a bunch of Intel devices to do. The project itself, it's done out of uh, off-shelf components, like it's like normal hubs, nor normal power cutters, what you can uh, buy. Uh, you can use Arduino, fast keyboard emulator, and pretty much that's it. Like uh, overall ownership uh, or cost ownership uh, is minimal. And we have actually a prototype which uses uh, BeagleBone as uh, keyboard emulator and mass storage device. So like, you, we even simplified the setup for that. But if you're interested how it is done, uh, this project is done by my colleague Igor Stopper, and he did a presentation uh, last year in ELC in the United States for that. A few other things. Build history. When you're producing your distributions, you, you want to understand what is actually in your build. The basic Octo or Open Embedded Tools, we are providing build history, but the reason or the initial idea of build history, it was primarily to support the package feeds. So you, you know like how your package feeds are going. We need something in addition to that. We wanted to know exactly in each build what is part of it. So what, what files with which revisions we were used for every single recipe in our build. And we created a uh, class which is called Build History Extra. Unfortunately, it's not yet an OE core, but I hope it will be merged anytime soon into it. And we have a set of scripts uh, in our CI system which actually helps to do, to track what is part of your build. So if you look at the uh, Ostro project build history, you will see what for every single build produced by our system, we have a tag. And inside tag, if you start, like you, you can compare the tags and you see what is actually changing between those builds. As state, um, for people who are using Yocto, you know all the problems with it, right? We tried, um, we have massive set of jobs, we have massive set of builds, what is happening all the time. So we end up in a scenario where each builder actually have its own local S state. And when after the builds is happening, the builders are synchronizing S state to the central place, to the coordinator, to our, to our NAS, and when we are publishing that state. Reason for that is just purely performance or sometimes with bugs and NFS servers. Another thing which, again, not always obvious is when you do the builds in the sandboxes, like for the pull requests, you don't want to pollute your normal S state, what you are using for release builds. So we are creating like the temporary S states for the pull requests. And that actually helped us to catch several bugs. So PR server I already mentioned, you need to be careful when you are using it for multiple branches and parallel builds. I would think, like performance and disk operations. Um, here I wanted to say one thing. Yocto is trying to help with local development. So it tries to see what you have enough disk space, you have download directory in a proper place, but if you have scenarios where when you download the source directories are over NFS, these nice features for developers actually killing your performance. So your uh, 
BitBake will be constantly trying to check if there is enough disk space. And if you look at the NAS monitoring, you will see like constant flow of uh, requests to an NFS server. It's probably not something what you want to use. So verify your settings, what you're actually using, and monitor your hardware, like how it's happening. Last but not least, um, we integrated to Yocta Core, uh, well, to open embedded core, a tool called BIMAP tools. So if you're constantly making web device images and like, you know, you know what's the scenario. It's raw image, four gigabyte, you, you flash it with DD. Not really efficient. Uh, especially like if you have a real data on what image is about like 500 megabytes or like 20% of it. So we introduced it with BIMAP tool. BIMAP tool is something what understand what how to like how much of real information is present in the image, and you, when you are flashing to the device, you flash only those amount of uh, valuable information. Have a look. Maybe it will simplify your life. So I think that's it. I'm open for questions. Uh, links to all of the things uh, what I showed, it, it will be in my presentation, like the next slide. So when you download it, have a look. Questions? This one. Ah. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, and one thing which I wanted also to say is, if you have any questions after this, feel free to send me a mail. I will try to answer. So you Okay, so question is, we are testing on, uh, on real hardware using EFT, and uh, is it possible to vir virtualize? Um, let me answer it that way. I'm working for a hardware company. <laughs> so for us, yes, in early stage of, uh, of development, virtualization is usable. But in the end of the day, we want to ship a product which will be working on the real hardware. So for us, it's most important what it works. Like obviously, you can have a build targets which runs in QEMO if you are just interested in some software features, which is not related to hardware. Um, for us, it's less important. But if you look at what's happening in public Yocto project, majority of way tests what we run, it's done in QEMO. You can use whatever we have. Yes. Okay, so uh, Yeah. It's it's more it's more about how we organize it by the directories. So, uh, like local builders, we have local state. Uh, between the builders, it's shared in a builder cluster on the network storage, so the builders can fetch the object if it's not uh, if it's not present locally. And when uh, for pull request, we just put in it into separate directories so it doesn't pollute. So like different sync target. Um, good question. So how we validate a state what it's still valid? Um, 
because everything what we do is through pull request. So practically for pull request, you have a cleaner state of uh, a state. So you have built inside pull request, which is taken a state of official build plus where changes what is part of a pull request. When we change this merge it, it's done against the official state. So we, we can verify what actually the result, what we've seen in a pull request build is not different from what after we merge. That's one thing. Second thing, it's an overall. Okay, even the official state might be broken. We had uh, some time ago so called like nightly build jobs which pretty much done one single thing. It took the latest state of a branch, wipe out the whole uh, estate, disable estate mirrors, and then do a clean build. It's slow, but at least once a day it shows us um, how we were performing. Luckily, in like over one and a half year, we've seen just few scenarios where it, it actually helped it to catch a couple of bugs. Another thing what we're actually actively using is um, OE self-test for recipes. So when the, when the orchestration of a uh, build is triggered uh, for platform uh, repository, so we, we start to build for real targets. But we have one more additional job which called self-test. With self-test, it goes through all the recipes and actually tries to verify what um, yeah, did I lost mic? Um, it tries to verify what um, recipes or some environment where uh, parameters of a host system is not affecting the checksums of a state. So if something will try to invalidate a state, we will see it. Well, self, well, self test will be failing. We are not trying to. We are, we are not trying to prevent it. I'm. I'm. No. I'm serious. Like, um, it's. Let's say our image consumes a lot more space than our state, so we can afford like a few hundred of gigabytes of data. Well, we're doing something like that. I mean, our state is just floating in on the terabytes. When probably you need to see what actually changes your checksums that often. Because what is in state means in reality? Like it, it, it checks what. Well, we, we build it for a lot of our products and. Still, it's, it, it sounds a bit suspicious. For that, I would suggest uh, try to grab the Yocta developers in yeah. above, like uh, like Richard. I think Richard will be the best person to 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 help with that.
Okay, so first question. Uh, combo layer, submodels, and why not to use a repo? You can use it. If it's good for your workflow, you are free to use it. Uh, in our case, in our team, the developers were simply not happy about repo. So I, I try to utilize what our teams are doing, like, like combo layer, what, what the Okta guys are doing. Uh, second question is about how we maintain with jobs. So, there are two sides of that question. So platform, platform uh, CI, it, it's done in separate repository. And yes, we perform the same thing, like it's pull requests, we review what is happening where, and sometimes we try to, to do the same changes in the staging environment to see if it properly works and only afterwards merge to production system. Uh, the CI system for product, the Jenkins pipeline, it's part of a repository and the scripts. So it's again, all the changes are done through pull requests and we have this safety, the same safety measures. So if, if a pull request comes from one of our developers, it's built automatically. We assume what it's, we're not trying to harm us. But if it's, gone, if it's coming from any un, random user on GitHub, it will not build unless the maintainer says, like, try it. Okay, so you have a pair of eyes. Yes. <laughs> it, only for unknown people. Well, is that in, in Vegas, right? It's um, courtesy of uh, plugin what we are using for, to trigger our builds. It's uh, GitHub pull request builder. Okay. Yes. Um, related to how you uh, handle uh, when, when there is when someone is, is gives you a pull request, um, sometimes at least my experience is from our builds are that it's not uncommon that we need to do changes. So, <laughs> we handle it in uh, two ways. One way is um, like we perform a test request. Test request to uh, uh, release the repository where all the changes are combined. So, like, because it's self hosted repository, you can change any file in it, regardless from which layer it comes. And when we are ready, we, we see with what this state of this set of changes are working fine. We actually split them by pieces and then integrate to a layer. At that point, the maintainer can temporarily ignore the situation, what like the layer branch building is actually become broken. But we know what as soon as we merge it into the layers, the upstream monitor will kick a, kick in, combine those changes together, and then produce it as a proper pull request again. And then again, it will bring it to a proper buildable state. We ignore the broken state of the layer branch for a very short period of time to, to, to synchronize those changes again. Yeah. So, no, 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 I mean, like, was splitting the test request to like more branch of pull requests to, to each layer and when it temporarily ignore the uh, broken state, yes, it's manual. It's, it's manual override. Historical, no, it's just a historical reason. So this project, uh, what I'm talking about with uh, reference IoT Linux distro, it happens for a while. And pipeline is recent stuff, so like six months or something. So basically, like if you would do it again from scratch, 
I will probably use for a pipeline. It's just, it's just classical thing. Like some, some people prefer one way, some people already move to another way. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show and demonstrate what, even if you do it in a classical way, where it means how to automate the things so you don't need to man manually maintain it. Good question. So, again, one of the reasons why I told promoting all, all of these things like continuous delivery is when I have ability to easily look or like easily monitor the quality of changes what is coming on from upstream, you can have in parallel, like you can follow a master, you can follow a stable branches and you can always have like multiple branches in your project to see how your stuff works on top of the upstreams. So for, your, uh, for you, the upgrades between major versions, it becomes predictable. In our case, with reference Linux uh, for IoT, we, we don't even bother with um, following the stable branches. We are always on master. We know what, if something broken in master, it will be called by our testing. We simply will not merge those stuff until it get to a point or into a shape what it's usable for us. And it allows us to actually to work uh, very close to this upstream. So if we introduce something which breaks us, we immediately, like in a few hours, we can say like, guys, you're doing something wrong here, fix it. Gentlemen, I think we're running out of time. I will be happy to answer our questions in the corridor or just grab me in the 